today on the Perception and Action podcast, Perception and Action Journal Club number 12, Talent Identification and Selection, a roundtable with Joe Baker, David Mann, Jörg Schorer, and Nick Wadey. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I had a really interesting roundtable discussion with a great group of talent ID researchers. Topics we covered include what exactly is talent, how good are we at talent identification and selection, and what impacts does this process have on sports and society? What are the pros and cons of early specialization? And what is the future of conferencing? Hope you enjoy. Okay, we're live. Um, welcome to another edition of the Perception Action Journal Club slash roundtable. It's be more of a, the latter uh, today. So today we're going to be talking about talent ID and talent selection mainly. And so I thought uh, first I'd um, let I'm uh, going to go around the virtual room and let these guys introduce themselves. They're all new. Some of them, a couple of them have been interviewed before, but they're new to this uh, kind of thing. So uh, on here on this format. So um, I'll let you guys introduce themselves. So right next to me is Jurg in the middle. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Jörg Schor. I'm at the University of Oldenburg in Germany. I do stuff on talent, and most of the stuff that I work on is handball or table tennis. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. Nick? Hi, I'm Nick Waddy uh, from Ontario Tech University in Oshawa, Ontario, Canada. Uh, and, yeah, kind of similar to Jörg, I'm um, very much interested in talent ID and development and expertise development in sport. Um, and kind of a mixed bag in terms of the sports that I look at, but uh, certainly a lot of hockey and uh, a lot of baseball right now as well. Great. Bottom in the, from the library, Joe. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm uh, Joe Baker from New York University. And uh, yeah, first, just a uh, happy anniversary and congratulations to Rob on, uh, on the podcast. I'm a very big fan of the show and glad to be here talking about talent with these uh, with these characters. Cool. And Dave in the bottom left. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm David Ben. I'm uh, I work at the Free University in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, you can probably tell that I'm not Dutch though. I'm from Australia. I uh, started professional life as an optometrist, uh, then moved uh, into uh, work in, in skill acquisition in sport in particular. I moved to the Netherlands eight years ago. Uh, so interested in vision, skill, learning in sport, and, and that dovetails into talent identification. Cool. And so, yeah, so we want to talk about talent. So I, literally, I think I could just say talent, go, and then we probably <laughs> get stuff down. But, but I thought, so one of the things like it interests me, and I think, you know, hearing Joe and a lot of you guys speak is is um, kind of this paradox we have of talent, how critical it is uh, on the one hand, this talent ID and talent selection process. And I'll give you an example from, I don't know if you guys follow base, how much you follow Major League Baseball, but it's basically been decided in Major League Baseball to cut the draft from 40 rounds to five. So they're gonna, instead of drafting 1,200 players, they're going to draft 150, right? So that's a huge, massive effect on, on talent. Who's going to get a chance? And I know I could randomly pick any player, you know, uh, if I, I, you know, Jacob de Grom, who won the Cy Young the last two years, was the 272nd pick, right? So he wouldn't get a chance. So, we, and never mind the effect on kids and lower levels. So it's a huge effect, and yet we don't seem to be very good at it at the same time. So, um, you know, that example I just gave. So to start, I just want, you know, where do we stand with this process? You know, what, what are you guys thinking about? What are some of the, you know, are we getting, making headway and improving it? Uh, maybe with things like the relative age effect, um, and kind of what are you, what are you thinking about in terms of where we're going with the talent ID and selection? So does anyone want to jump in? Maybe I'll point to Joe first. <laughs> yeah, well, geez, that's a big loaded question. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, it's an interesting one. The, and the professional baseball uh, example is such a you know it's such a great natural experiment that we're going to get this year, um, and I think. You know, we've done a bit of work with professional teams and the 
big factor that we keep coming up against is, yeah, the identification of the talent for the playing field is part of the equation, but there's more elements to the equation than we think. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, filling the the AAA and the farm system is part of it so that they can develop that one, you know, that smaller proportion of people that are actually going to go on to the majors. The, The making the number one, choice a good one so that you sell more jerseys and get more energy and excitement for your team like all of these things are part of that draft strategy so um when we look at it just on the face of the accuracy of it it looks like they're poor but i think that is because as sports scientists we don't maybe understand how complex that equation is that they use to select those players so you know for us i think it's important that we work with teams and work with the actual end users of the talent to understand, well, you know, why, why would you choose that player over this person who looks like they're better on paper? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, understanding that complexity is important. Yeah, definitely. Um, Nick, do you want to? Yeah, and I think, you know, just to, to jump on what Joe was saying, we had some discussions with some Major League Baseball front office people and about something like relative age effect, and they're completely aware of it. Um, aware of the pitfalls of, um, you know, you know, someone appearing talented when maybe they may not be and vice versa. Um, and, and yet they're still, for example, like purposely picking relatively younger, um, members of the cohort because they see them as just having more upside. They're younger. They've got more upside. Mm-hmm. And so completely aware of the bias, completely aware of the risk and, and, and making a decision that, that we kind of don't see maybe in our studies like we don't see you know we may think oh well the younger relatively younger athletes are developing into more talented players longer term but is that actually what's happening um in a in a kind of ecologically uh, valid sense or is it is it more of just like a risk management decision on on the part of talent selectors um i think there's a lot that we don't know about what you know what, what we're doing kind of in some of our studies and what we're seeing in the data and, and what's actually happening on the ground. Yeah. How about you, Dave? You've been, you've done a little on the, the relative age effect. Are you seeing kind of any impact or, um, what's going yeah. on with that? Yeah. On a population level, no, I don't think so. I think if anything, the effect's getting stronger. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are clubs and organizations, I think, that are making targeted efforts to get better and are having success. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's easy to do that on a small scale when it's just your club or just your organisation. When you want to move it to a broader whole competition context, and it takes some, well, it's likely to take some really wholesale changes to your competition structure or or some, you know, what are you doing you know, to to, for instance, decrease the age band? You've got to increase the number of teams and coaches and facilities and infrastructure. So, uh, yeah, I think from a, a population level. We haven't got as far as we should. Yeah. What about you? Your what are some of the things you're thinking about with in this area? Well, I'm pretty sure that we don't really have answers as scientists yet either, mm-hmm. because we don't have the longitudinal stuff that we need. And if you talk about the relative age effect, for example, it's a developmental process that we don't really look at. Most of the stuff we really do is cross sectional and have a look at that and say, okay, that's really bad. But it's all about how far do you need to develop. And if you look at uh, specific sports, the amount of players that you choose as a talent development, if you look at German soccer, for example, they take thousands of kids to develop, but they only need one, uh, the one next national team player in the long run. So I'm pretty sure that we don't have a clue so far about most of the stuff because we don't have the chance to look at it longitudinally because most of the partners that we face up with in sports are not there for very long. So you might work with the one national coach for two or three years, but then this guy or this woman is gone and you have to go to the next one. Yeah. And that makes it really hard to answer any of those questions. Yeah, that, that is really, what about, yeah, as, as researchers, are you getting any more access to, I know, for example, I think I heard, a story about, I think it was the Cincinnati Reds, again with baseball, that someone released the scouting notes, the talent evaluations of players from years ago. Like, are, do we, are you getting any more access to kind of 
information about talent ID or is it still held, you know, and, and tightly and you don't get to see it? Yeah. Anyone? Well, it really depends on how good of a partnership you have. Mm -hmm. um, my colleague, Dirk Bush, with whom I'm working quite a bit here in Oldenburg, is having a great access to the German Hamtel talent selection system. Mm -hmm. So we have a data set for the last 12 years, basically, what kind of tests they've done, what kind of questionnaires they've done, and the performances, and can now follow up where they actually ended up. But that's a really rare situation. I don't think there's too many people out there in the world that have that kind of access to a sporting organization. Yeah. So you're more looking at just the outcomes of the, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, and I think the data that, that often we get is, is still at the, at the later end of the athlete development kind of process. Like it, it's often pre-elite um, and, and still, you know, pretty advanced ages, like late adolescence, middle adolescence. Um, and so the data, you know, do we have good quality data going back into early adolescence, childhood, when really talent select, like the first talent selections and decisions are being made? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we've got great data. Um, and I think maybe that speaks to your point longitudinally as well. Um, that, and even if there is that data, what's the quality of that data? How accurate is it? What's the error mm -hmm. kind of around it? I think there's a, there's a lot of issues that, that we're still trying to grapple with in terms of access to data for, for talent ID and development. Yeah. Um, so, so I think our access is, I guess things are a little bit different in Europe and outside of North America, and particularly in North America, you have your draft system mm -hmm. uh, where most professional sports, they don't actually uh, pick up, for want of a better term, the, the, the athletes until they're you know, maybe 21, 22. Here we have much more closed environments. So we have football academies, for instance, that start at five, six years mm -hmm. of age and, and have a very closed environment. We, we generally have quite good access to those data to work with those organizations. Um, last week, Hockey Federation sent me a, a spreadsheet with 164,000 uh, players <laughs> in it and all their dates of birth and, and their clubs and their organ uh, level and all of this. I'm like, whoa, this is uh, out there. So I think, yeah, it, it's perhaps a bit better here in, in Europe than it is in North America because you have the different system in place. Yeah. And I think the, the one thing that we're really noticing is that um, the – Organizations will allow you access if you uh, if you demonstrate your value to the organization and you're not going to exploit them. I think that's always been the issue that teams have run up against is they get exploited by researchers and they don't really see the value. Mm -hmm. And what we found is um, they're really at least some of the groups that we were they're really hesitant to share something that could provide them with a competitive advantage. Uh, and so I think that's something that as researchers, we don't really have a lot of experience with. Um, if you find something and it's a really cool effect that nobody's ever found it, they don't want to share that. They want to keep that in-house and, um, and try to see how they can use that, to, especially in the draft system, how they can make better decisions, how they can use that to their own advantage. And that's part of the equation, I think, that we don't really understand that well. Is how do we capture that without you know, undermining the relationship? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it is a very tricky <laughs> point to dance, and and it's very it's a very hard thing to just anonymize and generalize too, right? There's so much yeah. detail in there you want to keep. And uh, um, how you know are we getting a better understanding of how talent of ID and selection happens? Like what what people are looking? You know, obviously the, the relative age effects showing that they're looking. You know, your focus may a lot on physical relative physical stature to a relative to your age um you know i'm thinking of kind of stuff like your dave you're what you're trying to do with the the uh, you know olympics things is trying to identify kind of like a task analysis what are the qualities needed for this actual sport to be successful in the sport to define it um i don't know whether you know there's been that kind of thing broader in, in talent if, if that makes any sense yeah yeah i, I guess uh, um what I've been trying to do is, is, a, is work with the clubs and federations and, mm. and let them say what they're looking for in athletes. I, mean, yeah. I guess the traditional approach has been for us to go do research and tell people what they should look for. Mm. Uh, I prefer to work with the clubs and the federations, let them choose or help them have a strategy for what they're looking for and then try to determine can they actually pick up on those characteristics uh, or are there other implicit or explicit biases that are influencing uh, their ability to pick those 
Uh, uh, so, for instance, at some of that work with the hockey, feder- sorry, not the field yeah. hockey federation, uh, the Canadians, <laughs> um, they, uh, we, we look and say, what, what factors are most related to what they're picking? They say that they're looking for technical skill and tactical skill and passing, and it turns out mm-hmm. they, they tend to pick the shorter, least mature mm-hmm. players with little relation to um, to to their, their technical skills. So yeah. the key challenge for us to try to understand why that's there and how we can change their behavior. Yeah. What about you? I saw you, you tweet uh, your earlier today about asking about what I for talent means. Uh, so you've been, th- well, I think you, yeah. We're, we're currently, there's a PhD student of mine, Francisca Lahat, who wants to look at the coach's eye for talent. Mm-hmm. And we Thought, yeah, coach's eye, sure, there is a coach's eye for talent, it seems like. That's how most of the selections are actually made, uh, from my experience. And we tried to define it, and we have not a really good idea how to define it, so we looked at the papers that are out there that actually use the term, and they're less than 10. Oh, really? That we found so far, and it seems like the, the obvious piece in the puzzle to look at the coach or the coach's eye to understand how the selections and decisions are actually made. But we hardly have any research on that. We have one paper with Joe where we looked at different ideas of different people doing talent selection from experts to lay people, basically. And the difference is not that big, but still all the coaches believe, and it might well be, that they actually see it when they see it. So um, it is really difficult to find out what would it be? How do they decide? Is it something intuitive like David said? Is it something they can explic- explicable, uh, bring it to the explicable world? Sorry, the drama in me. <laughs> um, there's lots of research out there that we haven't looked at. And when you look at the two different approaches that most of the times are taken, the one that is data-driven versus the idea of uh, just the coach's eye, they're totally different, but they might be just as good. And so far, we as researchers don't come up with the magical talent formula that we could use to predict the future. We have no clue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in a way, I think I said it to you guys. In the, it reminds me in a way of the, you know, the practice, the learning performance paradox we talk about, right? Talent is about the future. It's about yeah. learning your capacity. Yeah. Whereas, it, is it you guys find it's it's hard? People are basing a lot of judgments on the present, like how well you know how many goals are scoring as a kid in whatever league. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, I think, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. I think a, a lot of people that are doing talent ID are, are really doing performance ID. They're they're selecting athletes that give them the best chance to win games in the now and, and immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's at the heart of you know, things like the relative age problem or biases in, in talent, talent ID. Um, and, and I think that's kind of inherent to the structure of a lot of our competitive youth sport. Um, and it's, it's one of our biggest challenges, I think, is, uh, is redefining that. And, and to be fair to the coaches, I mean, we don't have a great idea of how to identify talent in the long term. So they're kind of working with, with what they have, picking athletes that are, um, giving them a chance to win and that in all fairness, if they're bigger, they're going to be faster and stronger, which I mean, I, I don't, it's hard to suggest what the alternative is at that point. Um, aside from restructuring the priorities of, of competitive youth sport. Yeah. I think, I think that's a good point that they, both you and Jurg have just made though, right? Like the, the problem is we have a system that's based on selection and this idea that, you know, we should be able to identify the most talented players. Um, and there's this assumption that there's mountains of evidence at which this system's been based on. And then when you start to peel back the layers of the onion, you see that, no, this idea about talent, we don't know very much about it at all. And what we do know is that coaches are biased, which is why the relative age effect's been around for 30 years. There's no good evidence for accuracy of selection decisions. But we have this system that we're stuck with that says, this is how you identify athletes. This is what you need to do in order for them to be nurtured properly. You need to give them all these opportunities and access to the best coaches. And if you look at the evidence for the system, there really isn't any. But coaches are still faced with this reality that 
you know, it would be great if you could keep everybody, but you can't. Mm. Uh, and we know that your decisions are going to be flawed and you don't have any evidence on which to make them, but you're going to have to make them anyway. And so um, that's just the reality is, you know, once you start working with people in the system, you really feel for how complex and problematic this process is, but it's still a process they're going to have to go and do on Saturday, on Sunday, uh, whatever, whenever sports get back together, they're going to have to make decisions about who gets to stay and who leaves, knowing full well that the decisions are flawed. Yeah, no, I think that's it. You're right. And just to add on that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go for it. Yeah. And just to add on that, most most of those coaches are paid by performance of their teams at the moment and not by the development of the players in the long run. So if they don't perform during the, um, being the national coach, they're fired. Mm -hmm. So the system actually asks them by the system they get paid to look at performance instead of development. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really, really hard for them to look mm -hmm. the long term. Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, I think that's a really the 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 current performance focus. You're right. You're right. You can't help it. It's to me as a, like a skill acquisition uh, person, it worries me because at the same time we're giving people the message: you need to be variable. You need to make mistakes in practice. Practice should be messy if you want to improve. We're telling you you're going to be selected based on your performance, immediate performance. So it's a really counter conflicting message, right? You have to look good all the time and you, you got to be, <laughs> make mistakes and willing to fail to get better. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah, so that's a really challenging issue. Is there, a, I don't know if there's a way to motivate, you know, I, I, I would think that a lot of it is just kind of intrinsic motivation of a coach that cares about the long term. You know, you get some coaches that are more, care about the long-term development and the athletes versus ones that I'm just going to use you <laughs> to, to be successful in the short term. So, um, the, um, the, this, I got a question already. I'll put it up here. This, um, so this one, so <laughs> this is a great one. Everyone, we all uh, complain about this, you know, you were for, if we're so bad at it, right? We're so bad at it, even when we do it as close as possible to the actual high level. Why do we keep yeah. trying to do it younger and younger? And what's the way? What maybe? And what's some way we can try to combat that? Anyone want to jump in with that? Well, it's I'm currently work. Good job. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> So it's one of the it's one of the things that we've been wrestling with uh, and more as um, you know the great thing about the uh, lockdown and, and staying at home at the moment is you got a lot of time to wrestle with ideas that normally you wouldn't get a chance to wrestle with and one of the ones that we've been wrestling with in our research group is what would happen to kids development if you removed early selection from the system and on the one hand you think, yeah, they might not get the opportunities and the feedback and the coaching um, that they would get if they were in an organized system. The alternative explanation is that they would seek those things out because they're intrinsically motivated based on confidence and that if you're really well suited for an activity, your natural drive for confidence is going to get you to seek that activity out. And so, you know, on the one hand, you could make an argument that things probably wouldn't change that much if we didn't select kids early. And you could, you could also make the point that given the early specialization and the need for fundamental movement skills and diversification and the value and all that kind of stuff, there's probably benefit to not doing those select, more benefit to not doing those selections than there could ever be possible, you know, beneficial effects for making that selection but we still do it anyway, which means that there's a problem with the system, not a problem with the evidence. Yeah. Uh, Jörg, did you want to? Yeah. I just um, talked to the people from the German Table Tennis Association, and they want to start selecting at the age of 8 to 12. And we're currently working with them on techniques uh, as a talent predictor, but what they actually argue is they compete against the Chinese. And within China, there is thousands and ten thousands of kids willing to put in the hours that they need to be the very best players and then they look at the German players that actually made it into the top ten or were even the number one player in the world and those were all kids that started working with their parents or their 
dad most of the times at the age of four or five. And they are totally convinced that they need all the hours that have to be done that needs to start at the age of 10 latest. They'd rather have them at the age of six if possible. Mm -hmm. Because they know that's the amount of training you have to put in within table tennis. If you look at different sports, that's a totally different story. If you would have a world championship in um, Quidditch, for example, we could easily start at our age and probably still compete. <laughs> yes. But for table tennis or gymnastics, <laughs> well, probably not you, Nick, but <laughs> there's a challenge. I, I might work. Yeah. Um, what about Dave? Uh, what, what you you were talking sure. about the youth academies earlier? You know, obviously there's some negatives, like with this what is talking about. But overall, you think there's positives to kind of starting this this you know the stream early on? Yeah, I, Jan that's asked that question is a scientist yeah. for the Dutch Football Federation, yeah. so I feel like it's a, a bit of a loaded yeah. question. Uh, he's working with these questions on a daily basis. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to stand up for early specialization a little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, as a as a parent, I might not want to do it. And as a, if I was a uh, the head of a of a national sports federation across sports, I might not want to do it. But if I was the head of a football academy, I can clearly see why you would do it. Uh, particularly again in, in Europe, they're so competitive across the different academies that the, the key motivation they start so early is that so that other they sign up these kids so other clubs don't get them. They see some sort of talent and we can question whether they've seen something or not, uh, but they see talent and they want to keep it. And, and for some of these academies, they feel like they need the 12 years from 6 through to 18 to actually teach the skills in a, in a complex sport like, like football. And again, I, we can debate that. But the, I think if, if you want to develop an excellent footballer, then early specialization probably is, is, is your best chance of statistically getting there. If you want to develop an elite athlete, it's probably not. But if, if you have your interest in one sport, then I can see the motivations there. And, and in a lot of cases, it does work. That there's there's multiple pathways to success. Yeah. So I can I can imagine the the uh, social media exploding right now with your endorsement <laughs> of uh, early specialization. But I, you know what? I'm on the same page as you, Dave. But I think part of what we're missing in the early specialization is the idea that this is a dichotomy without really understanding that we need to understand what's the mechanism of negative effect that comes from specialization. And if mm. we can mitigate that and design better, you know, you know, singular sport training um, programs where we balance what the negative mechanism is, then we can, we can remove the effect. It's and I think, I think back to athletes who are just absolutely obsessed with their sport and they just, all they want to do is, is practice football. All they want to do is, is kick a football around and tell me that taking that kid away from something that they love to do and making them do something that they don't like to do is a positive thing for their development. You can't convince me of that argument. Can, you can convince me that we need to develop better motor skills so they don't get injured or balance training loads so that we're not over, uh, you know, we're exceeding developmental capacities of their system. But don't tell me that, you know, somebody who's intrinsically motivated in one area, you can build intrinsic motivation by giving them other things to do that they don't like. Um, so I think part of what we're missing is the fact that there's a mechanism here that we don't really understand that's part of athlete development. We need to understand better. Yeah. yeah, I think there, I think there's something else to it. I think there's I think there's actually also a bit of a disconnect between kind of like academic discussions about early specialization and often what's really happening on the ground. Like we can look at a kid who's training almost year round, is in a high performance environment, um, and we can label that early specialization as lots of deliberate practice happening. But good pedagogy, like a good coach and good pedagogy, like there's still those drills are still going to be have to have some element of fun and enjoyment involved in them. Like they're, they're designed, like it's the art of coaching, like they're designed to improve skill, right? Like in that sense, it's deliberate and it's deliberate practice, but it still can be developmentally appropriate um, with, with de developmentally appropriate volume type of training and enjoyment in the drills. Like I think, I think sometimes there's a disconnect. I think part of that comes from the dichotomy that you're talking about that it's either early specialization or it's not. But I think 
I think there's a lot of variation in what is early specialization as well in terms of you know what the kids are actually doing in in a in a weekly, monthly, yearly kind of training environment. Yeah, I think you're you're right. You, you, those are great points. York, did you want to? Uh, the the question that we have to be clear about is that we're talking about that they are supposed to become elite athletes. I'm not so sure if early specialization is really good for the ones that make don't make it in the long run. If they lose the fun out of the sport after some uh, time, and if the global health of a population is actually really benefited by early specialization. If you have almost like a Darwinian approach of saying survival of the fittest in the long run for elite sports, then I'm pretty sure no one has a problem with early specialization. Yeah. No, those are great yeah. points. You're right. Early specialization has become a term people stop listing. <laughs> like it's a dirty yeah. word. And yeah. you're right. I think you're right. It needs more. Like in baseball pitching, you're, I think, agree with you, Dave, right? If you want to develop a baseball pitcher, the best plan is probably to have a lo- year long periodized training system where you get more and more specialized and you do a lot, you plan it out how they're going to do it. The problem is that that's not what happens. They, they go from a season to going to these tournaments where they throw as hard as they can in front of scouts and things. So it's not the specialization that's a problem. It's how it's being done <laughs> the, in, per se, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's a great point. I was wondering, a uh, question I is wondering how, you know, the kind of the advance in kind of sports analytics and, and the way that we can uh, measure things and record things has changed the effect of the talent ID process. A lot of people, I keep referring to baseball. That's my thing. <laughs> a lot of people said in baseball, we've moved towards a lot towards more talent development in baseball, um, and less talent ID. And a lot of people have claimed a reason for that is because all scouts have the same information now. Every ballpark tracks, you know, swing exit velocity. They track all this data so they can, they have the same information. So they're, they're judging the players on the same thing. So the advantages you can gain from scouting are going down, like the talent ID. So I don't know if you've seen that in the sports you guys work in. Has that, how's kind of the advance in measurement and analytics changed the talent ID? No, big question. <laughs> yeah. Well, should I start? Sure, go sure. for it. Yeah. Um, from my point of view, that only makes sense if you actually have the idea what the formula is for an elite player. Mm-hmm. And the sports that I look at, they're so diverse in the way they play. If you look at football, uh, soccer for the Canadians, um, there's so many different types of players that you can actually, uh, that can actually reach the highest level of performance. Messi looks totally different than Cristiano Ronaldo, than uh, Michael Ballack was, or a goalkeeper like um, Oliver Kahn was. They're totally different. And which kind of numbers do you actually want to look at? And even if you look at the same position, there's totally different players in there. Mm -hmm. So if you don't know what the formula at the end is, what the player needs to have, how could you actually look at the numbers that you have? have in there that might be different in baseball Mm -hmm. because it seems to be very quantifiable Mm -hmm. but in most other team sports i would say "Mm, they're trying to use it but they still depend on the coach's eye Mm -hmm. yeah nick did you yeah and and there's and this is you know something that that i'm stealing from your i mean there's there's an element of predicting what the future of a sport is going to look like as well Mm -hmm. um you know, like sports to some degree are an, arm ra- an arms race, trying to constantly gain some kind of an advantage. Tactics change, styles of play change, uh, rules can change that open up new avenues, and, and that's very hard to predict sometimes. Um, and if you've got, and I've seen this, and I, I've heard anecdotes of this for, for town, um, town selectors, you know, kind of assigning random weights in their in their analytics to, to different variables that that are, you know, in a very real way, like they're quite random. Um, they're not based on anything concrete and you know it's are you trying to fit the data from the past Mm -hmm. and 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 to explain that data as accurately as possible um or are you trying to to forecast and 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 i think there's a big difference there um in terms of how you use the data yeah yeah i guess it does depend a lot on sport joe did you well, just it's it's a question that we've uh, started to look at over the last couple months. So we don't have anything published yet, but we've been looking at 
trends in prediction accuracy over time. And so, you know, if you look back at the last 30 years, you would expect to see spikes at the Moneyball era where analytics came in. You'd expect that access to more of this quantifiable data should improve prediction accuracy. But what we found is it's pretty flat. Like it, it hasn't really changed over the last 30 years, which means either we haven't gotten better at measuring the things that we're entering in our equation, or we have an outcome that's so inherently complex that it's there's a certain high degree of the variation that's just not predictable and maybe never will be. Mm-hmm. Which is maybe why we're starting to see teams focus more on development is because, hey, it's much smarter to put your energy into developing capacities as opposed to ruling them out as predictors of these outcomes. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. I get another point I, I see, you know, we kind of, I think we've talked a bit about it, you know, kind of this, the kind of, as a researcher, I can imagine it's difficult to, that, that kind of talent, <clears throat> talent and opportunity are kind of wrapped up. In each other, right? So as soon as I call you, you I pick you as a number one draft pick. You're automatically going to get way more opportunities, better coaching, more. Like I know in sports I work, you basically they give you a million chances to fail if you're the number one draft pick, right? Um, whereas the guy, the five hundredth guy, has basically one week in this ball to come up, and he has to look fantastic. So, what? How do you kind of deal with that that issue? Anyone have? Thoughts on that? I know I'm throwing a lot of tricky ones and picking out the big. <laughs> I don't work in this area, so I can pick out the big stuff. <laughs> well, I think like yeah. the economists have looked at that, yeah. right? That's called the sunk cost effect, mm-hmm. um, and they have shown that it, most professional sports, at least the ones in North America, have a pretty big sunk cost effect. That you, even if you're performing worse than a person who was selected in the in the previous or the next round or even further down in the rounds you get more opportunities in the face of worse performance Mm -hmm. uh so i think one of the things there um that you're raising rob is this idea that once we give people that feedback and we label them in that talent group, we start treating them differently. They become apples and oranges. And so these equations where we try to see, well, how accurate was that um, decision that you made, that selection that you made becomes almost impossible to, uh, to clarify because we've treated people absolutely differently. We, we've kind of created a situation to make our prediction come true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of. Um, which, which, is, yeah. which is amazing how bad we are <laughs> yeah. when we add that into the equation. The fact that now we've created this environment for these people to thrive because we think we've got talent. And the fact that our accuracy is so bad is really just a reflection of how complex or how poor we are at making these selections. Yeah. I think it speaks to the need for highly flexible talent development pathways uh, where there is the willingness to bring in later developing kids and to drop out ones that, that aren't uh, performing to what would be expected. I think a really nice example of that is, is the German Football um, Federation uh, where they, uh, I think, well, correct me if I'm wrong, you're 10 or 15 years ago kind of changed the pathway and made it extremely flexible so that if you're in the, in the national academies that you can drop in and out quite a lot and there's often... I think up to 50% turnover each year in the academy so that they, they don't have such big sunk costs and they're less likely to hold on to players they've invested in for a long time who might know who you know, increasingly are unlikely to make it. Yeah. Yeah, the, no. the addition that I would make there is that it's not only the national developmental system, it's most of the times the clubs that actually do the talent development and the clubs are really looking around by now. Um, we have some studies in, within German handball again, where we can show how important the national talent selection is actually for the, for the girls, because the club system is not out there. Mm-hmm. But for the males, it doesn't make a difference because they have the club system and it's a pretty professional club system by now. And therefore they can develop more of the kids. And therefore, if you don't get chosen at the very beginning, you still have a really good chance to make it up to the top. That's but that's probably European again because you don't have that club system during um, the, the child development or the talent development phase. It's mainly schools and stuff like that in Canada and the U.S. as far as I know. Mm-hmm. 
how yeah. important is it? You know, does that a lot of is that a lot of that having different levels? Like, how much does that matter in sports? You know, there's big differences in sports about how many levels of feeding system they have. You know, is, so is that? I'm sure that's kind of what you're talking about, Dave. The ability to flexibly move people up and down levels. Um, you know, without sticking. You know, we, they're here. They got to be here. Um, how, we, what do you guys see? You know, is that part one of the big parts of it? Yeah, I think so. Both, yeah, it's, say, within an age group, the ability to uh, move up the talent pathway and more towards national representation, for instance, or down depending on performance, and then perhaps also up and down age groups to account for some of the other uh, differences in maturation and, and, and age that we see as well. So I think a, a lot of smart organisations are moving towards more flexible systems rather than having that, you know, placing all their chips on, uh, on, on a few key bets and, and uh, investing in them over long term. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, I think that's a really important, I think, it, it, you know, and again, baseball has that system in principle, but it's influenced by a lot of factors that, you know, disrupt the ability to move people up and down, you know, how, whether they have options left, how much they get paid, <laughs> and things yeah. mess it all up. Well, yeah. Even for youth sport, like yeah. I know Ontario soccer here is, is trying to encourage that as much as possible, putting athletes where, um, in a context that gives them the best chance to develop and succeed. Um, but there's, for example, like a, a lot of pushback from parents. It's still seen as you're, you know, playing my kid up is good. Putting my kid down is, is bad. Mm -hmm. um, so you get a lot of pushback, um, even from parents about um, when people are trying to create open systems. Um, sometimes there's still a pressure to, to kind of, there's only one positive direction. Uh, for for athletes and where some parents want their kids to be, and it's it's a big challenge. It's it's a tough balancing act uh, for the organizations, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that's we talked a little bit about that the impact on the youth level, you know, the the, the fun and engagement and staying with sports and being fit. Your you know being an athlete your whole life. Um, you know, what are the, some of the the key issues you're seeing there? I guess you know I guess we're it's having a debt early talent selection has the same kind of negative effect on those things as well. Joe, I know yeah. you've worked in some of those. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because, um, like the, the point we keep talking about the system as being part of the problem. Um, but I think, you know, your question and the point that Nick just raised, uh, there's a lot of evidence that's starting to emerge that it's not coaches that are the ultimate controllers of what happens in the system. It's parents. And so a coach could say, I don't want you to specialize, but the parent is going to say, you know, what's the extra practice that my kid can be doing on the weekend? Uh, and so I think we really haven't appreciated how powerful that role of parents is in feeding a lot of this negative messaging into the system. I think there was a paper that came out a couple of weeks ago that showed decisions about early specialization were coming from parents, not from coaches. And I think that really, for me, rang an alarm bell because maybe we're not focusing in the right area in terms of messaging, in terms of system change. Yeah. No, I think that I see that here with, you know, we have a lot of different soccer clubs kids can sign up with and they have like dip, different levels. And you see, I've seen, you know, the kid doesn't get picked for the highest level one year. What do the parents do? They go to another club the next yeah. year, I mean, like, right? They, the the team has a plan for them how to develop what they think is best, but they're like, no, <laughs> we we're not happy. Um, yeah. We have so we have a, a question. We're going back to the uh, talent selection, early selection. They're going to pick on us. <laughs> we raised. It. So are are we saying is more effective in developing world class players? Is there? You know, I think I think there's two things: intuitively versus actual data. Um, Again, I think the tough part is what do you mean by early selection? Um, um, or are we early? I think we we're saying early specialization more than. Um, I think those two go hand in hand, yeah. right? Though, that's the issue. Um, Dave, do you want to <laughs> clarify? <laughs> well, I just had to turn my phone off because it's going. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's another part. They, they say, another part to this. It would be the. Even uh, it's that would be the case, even though the RA shows there are a lot of false positives. So, yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah. I guess the point I was trying to make there is that it, uh, as a parent, I wouldn't advocate early specialization. As a, as a government official, looking for population health, I wouldn't. But if I was running a, 
a basketball academy or a football academy, I can understand the motivation to 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 do that. And I, I think the statistics would say that you are more likely to produce an elite football player if you start and specialise in that sport early. But you're also more likely to screw a lot of kids up in the process. Mm. Uh, and and so again, that's why as a parent, I wouldn't send them there in case they went and they didn't make it. But as a as a football academy, where my sole goal is to produce elite footballers. I can understand why they, they do it. And so there's a key trade-off there. Uh, yeah, I guess that's that's the point. So to answer Jan's question, yeah, I, th- I think you are more likely to produce it through that pathway, but you're also likely to do more damage along the way. Yeah. No, uh, I, sorry. The thing that ahead, I you. would add is actually how good is the developmental system outside. Mm-hmm. So if you have enough people that can actually develop world-class athletes, then you don't have to uh, select that early. But if you only have a handful of coaches that are capable of developing talents into that uh, situation, then you probably have to select early. And the second thing is, if you look at team sports, quite often you have those really outstanding talents, the talents that even I could see in hockey uh, without knowing much about hockey, especially ice hockey. Um, those are the kids that everyone is capable of seeing and you can select them early with almost being blind about the sport. The question is more about the kids where you think, yeah, that or he or she could be a world-class athlete in the long run, but I might be wrong. And those are those broader cases that you have to select to fill, uh, to fill up a team where you probably lose some of the ones. So the very, very talented that you believe are there, and we've all been to talent selection where you sit down and say, this guy will play the national team later on. Um, those you see, but the border cases are the ones that we talk about where we probably do the most, most harm. Mm. And now the question is, how many of those border cases make it in the end in the long run? Yeah. But that's just an observation, not a data-driven answer. Yeah, I think there's almost two, like you have to kind of separate the issues of like burnout and enjoyment and lifelong fitness from the actual skill. Like everything we know about skill, you're right, Dave, like we deliver practice, the specificity of skill. You're right. The best way to make a great player is give them lots of training, right? There's no lots of specific training. I don't know how you could... Deny that, and just in terms of performance and skill, the, it's the other things. Once you the social factors, the, all these other factors. If you just took that out of equation, you know, I think a lot of people have said that's you know what happens at academies, right? They just get a ton of people, and whoever burns out, oh well, <laughs> right? You know, we'll just we we'll just play the odds and get them best. You know, keep doing this over and over with enough people, we're going to get good people. So. How do, how do we take those, put those things together though? You know, I guess you're right. You've identified it's a problem. It has to be at a higher level, right? It has to be a governing body kind of thing because if one team stops it, the other team's just going to jump in and take over, right? So how do you, yeah, Joe? Well, it, it's a, it's a billion dollar question, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, that's how we uh, integrate high performance sport into solving social problems problems like obesity and, and preventive health, all that kind of stuff, right? We're, we really, really think about the high-performance athlete development system and how it relates to those kinds of outcomes, but it's the flip side of the coin. And I think to Jörg's point, you know, if we create a system that's super specialized where nobody – ice hockey, an example, I think, is maybe developing into this kind of a system where all the top players go to – High performance ice hockey schools and they, they, the trajectory to the NHL is pretty clear. If you want to, if you go to those schools, your likelihood of making it is much greater than somebody who comes from the average, you know, neighborhood system. But when you do that, you undermine the fact that you want people coming through the system who know what it's like to play at least decent level, um, ice hockey because they're going to be your people that watch you on TV. They're going to be the next generation of parents who put the kids in the sport. It's a very, for me, I think it's a very short term strategy to think about this just from a specialization standpoint, which is the reason from our research group we look at it in terms of understand the mechanism. So even in those, specializers that are going to 
the academy that Dave's on the cusp of starting, um, <laughs> that we, we, we give them a better experience so that the system's more efficient at producing not just the league performers, but people who love sport and aren't going to be burned out by the time they're 13. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that we can absolutely meet both of those goals, but we can probably do a better job of mitigating the risk. Yeah, definitely. Nick, do you? And I, yeah, and I think we can, just to circle back around to what we were saying earlier, I think we can, part of mitigating that risk is rebalancing, like, the immediate performance versus long-term priorities. Right? Like, I, I think, I think that's, if, if we're, if we're trying to figure out the mechanisms and trying to, um, to decrease harm and, and almost take like a harm reduction approach, like a harm reduction strategy approach to talent development, then I think that's that's an important piece there. Um, sure, there's going to be risks, or there's risk inherent to sport, but how can we reduce the harm as much as possible with this? Mm -hmm. I know, I think I've seen some studies about this maybe, but I don't know how much you guys get into this. Um, you know, we talked about the problem of the parents, but has there been say like, what do the kids want? most kids want at that age do they want the super high competition the you know um has there been studies looking at that what kids are looking for I don't, do they want tons of tournaments and tons of you know um is there anything on that not that i'm aware of yeah. um like it's funny because the so a few of the um, journalists that i've talked to in the last month or so they're focused on um, how do we bring youth sport back for kids and, yeah. and things like that? And there's been a lot of discussion about why would we bring back the same system given its flaws and its problems? And so one of the questions I think some researchers are exploring is what is it about sport that kids are missing right now? Are they missing the winning? Are they missing the tournaments? Are they missing the friends? Are they missing the enjoyment? Are they missing the movement? And I don't know that anybody's really done a great job of answering your question, Rob, because it's tough to ask that question in the absence of what your parents are saying to you on the drive home, what your coach is saying to you when you get off the field. Like all that kind of stuff feeds into those motivation mechanisms that we don't really understand that one. Yeah. No, well, that's a that's a great point about this kind of reset we have right now. Um to think about, reflect on and hopefully you do. Dave, did you I'm gonna jump in. Uh, yeah, I agree. Joe, I haven't seen any research. If my kid's any guy, he just wants to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, you know, just wants to play. And football training started again here last week, and I drove him there, and he wasn't all that happy. And he got there and found out they were actually just going to play instead of do drills. He was ecstatic. Mm -hmm. uh, can we do that again next week, Dad? Yeah. He just wants to get out and play. Yeah. yeah. I guess that the other going back again, I was interested. You know, your your point about the eye for talents and. What you know? What approach can we take to understanding this elusive concept of talent? Is it a very specific thing of kind of like what maybe more I'm trying to do on the skill side of identifying the specific factors that are involved in a particular sport? Um, is it a more understanding like the capacity for learning? You know, I, it, it's very tricky. I know it's a very tricky thing. But what what are you guys some of your thoughts about? Or maybe what, what, to trying to figure out what this eye, what's your plan for trying to understand what this eye for talent is a bit better? Well, um, I probably shouldn't tell you what we're currently <laughs> trying to do as researchers because someone might steal the idea. But okay, just be back. Um, <laughs> of course, I'll still go because we're all private. No one is listening anyway. <laughs> probably. Um, Thank you. <laughs> uh, the, first, the first thing that we actually try to do is look at eye movements. Are they actually looking at something different? Okay. Um, people that don't have the coach's eye that follow a game and have the same task to look at a talent selection in a handball. Um, Corona made us get no data so far, but um, it's, I'm really curious is there any different eye movement strategy in coaches that should have an eye for talent than when Joe actually watches a handball game? <laughs> and Joe has some experience with handball, but not too much. So I can say he's a knee, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing that I think that needs to be done is check for reliability of coaches' decision. Mm -hmm. Can they actually reliably make the same decision again if they see the same kids uh, a month later? Or is there any variation in there? And I bet you there is. And there are so many different questions, starting from the definition of what actually is a coach's eye, 
to all those, what is the development to have a coach's eye? What is their actual expertise? How good are they? When we look at studies that Dan Cause and Joe have done, uh, it seems like they're not that much of an expert, given that they have an ill-defined problem in, at hand. Um, to me, that's a wide open field of research that we need to do for a long time to have really a, a small idea of what's happening there. Yeah. But uh, I think it's worth looking at it because we forget the coach. We forget in most of the talent selection and identification processes, the coaches and some of them have 20, 30 years of experience and have shown that they're successful for one or two of the players they actually played with. And it sounds like a really small amount of people that they have in there. But to be honest, that's probably great. Mm -hmm. I mean, Holger Schwindner found Dirk Nowitzki. <laughs> there it uh, is. <laughs> as a <laughs> <laughs> as a <laughs> I thought I have to put it in now before they actually close it there. Um, and develop him and saw something in him that other coaches didn't. I talked to other coaches that saw him play at the age of 14 and said, yeah, he's just a skinny dude. Mm -hmm. uh, probably not that special. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So w what, is, what was in his eye? What did he see that others didn't see? And I think that's something we have currently no idea about. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. So I think part of the problem that we're wrestling with is like it, on the face of it, it seems like a simple question. Uh, are you measuring what you think you're measuring? But one of the things that we've been doing over the last year is asking different groups of coaches to tell us what they think talent is. And we've been amazed at how variable that um, definition is. And so you know, from a research standpoint, if we can't operationalize what this concept is, then how can we ever test the measurement accuracy of it? How can we measure the coach's eye for talent if we can't even define what talent actually is? And it varies from coach to coach. And so for me, that's job number one is what the heck are we talking about when we say go and identify that person's talent? Uh, is it performance? Is it you think you're measuring their capacity to acquire and learn motor skills? Is it the speed at which they acquire those things? All of those things are showing up in definitions of talent, which is maybe the reason why, you know, this debate has been around for 150 years is no one knows what the heck they're talking about. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's definitely fair. Dave, did you? I was going to say, I think any good organization should have a strategy for what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, Best organizations I think that I've seen are, have a top down strategy. I mean, you know, everyone has a buy into what that strategy is, but, uh, there is a clear direction from the top of what they're looking for. For an athlete in 10 years, they need to have these characteristics because this is where the game is going. And these are the characteristics they're going to look for to, to pick that up. Um, and so you'd hope that the coach's eye aligns with the, the club strategy. And, uh, I'm interested in some of the biases that I think really, I think, Good scouts see through some of the biases, you know, confirmation biases and, and uh, stereotype stereotype biases. Like everyone, you know, a lot of people looking for sprinters are now looking for six foot six sprinters because Usain Bolt was tall, but before he came along, we assumed that sprinters had to be short. So we we get stuck with these recency biases, for example. I think good scouts can can see through some of those things. I think now in an age of of kind of data abundance, we've got even more ability to, to increase uh, how much feedback we get about our talent decisions as well. Not, not just about, okay, well, I picked this athlete. Did it work out? Did it not work out? But I didn't pick these athletes. And did they reemerge in a system? How accurate was I? Um, I think we've, at least at a high level of sport, we've got an increased ability to, to get feedback on, our, on, on the talent decisions. It's not so much at the, the younger ages, but later on, I think that's, one of the potential benefits of, of all the data that we have uh, mm -hmm. is that we can get increased or better fidelity on, on in, in terms of feedback on our, on our talent decisions. Um, yeah, no, those are great, great points. And I, I think one of the things I was thinking, of, I know we're all kind of psychology in the area, you know, is obviously talent is super, idea is super balanced, biased towards physical 
right? And physical abilities and movement abilities and perceptual cognitive. How to, you know, what's the, in terms of talent, you know, I think it, in Moneyball is a good example of that, right? And, um, and you used to think the ability to know the strikes out and take walks, which is something we'd teach you later on. Um, any player could learn that if they really wanted to, but now we've kind of that perceptual cognitive skills are actually a talent <laughs> that you, you, you have it. That's, you know, um, so where are we making any progress on understanding that and, and, and kind of incorporating that? What do you, what are your thoughts on that? We currently have a data set that is 10 years old that shows that the handful of players that were good on the pattern recall test when they were selected actually are now in higher leagues than uh, others that were worse there. It's one of those papers that needs to be written since uh, <laughs> I don't know how many years, but <laughs> the data set is out there. Uh, we have it in there. So pat pattern recall might be something that might be useful, mm -hmm. which is probably just a proxy for tactical behavior on the field. Mm -hmm. But that's just a proxy. Mm -hmm. Any you other? Know, yeah, I think this is the next frontier particularly from performance analytics. You know, I think if we look at the team sports where talent selection is usually quite challenging, um, we've gotten so good at measuring physiological parameters like GPS tracking or player tracking and all this. And now, just over the last year or two, you start to see systems come out for measuring decision-making using their systems and for measuring foresight. And uh, I think we're going to get a lot better at this. And um, I think the better organizations are going to be able to make inferences about the, the, in the past, we've measured these things in labs, but I, I get the feeling we're going to be able to use performance analysis to try and pick up all these things in a, in a more ecologically uh, sensitive way. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, it'd be really cool to see what happens as technology becomes more accessible, costs get driven down, um, how much that trickles down to, to more developmental levels of sport. And then, then I think we could potentially get access to all, all sorts of different uh, data and, and build that into our forecast be really interesting yeah for me i think the the part that you can really see the progressive teams the switched on teams are thinking about this not from the you know we're going to get the same level of objective predictability as we do with uh vertical jump or uh, like these more physical measures we i think the mistake is to assume that we're ever going to get the same level of reliability and validity of those kind of things. Yeah, they could be super huge in terms of their predictability, but measurement is always going to be problematic with these things because the, the, the influence of confounding variables and the noise is always going to be higher than it is for a physical test. Sports need to get comfortable with that noise. I think that's going to be, like Dave said, that's the new frontier is get comfortable with the noise and try to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think and yeah, to Dave's point, having a strategy and some bandwidth, it's like, you know, like if you're going to be a, an Olympic rower, right? Like a heavyweight rower, like you're going to need to be within this bandwidth of height, probably, right? And, and mm -hmm. same for the NBA. And so if you have these bandwidths of whether it's anthropometric characteristics, perceptual cognitive skill, et cetera, like I think, I think as that's kind of a, a, a good way to kind of start approaching it is, um, you know, what's, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? What's the, um, what's the realistic range that we're working with yeah. within sports specific context? Yeah. I think also maybe part and parcel with what we were just talking about is you, you were mentioning this a bit, Dave, is trying to make talent ID selection tests and measures more representative, right? Everyone's favorite whipping boy in with regards, this is the NFL combine, right? <laughs> Where you make people sprint straight ahead in the line which a football player never does, right? Yeah. And you try to say, everyone, their study showing has zero predictive value in terms of what they do in the NFL, but we keep doing it. Um, is there, is there, I guess that's part of all of this, right? Trying to make things more representative and the kind of stuff you're doing to actually uh, test something relevant to the sport you're, you're measuring. Yeah. You know, I, I find this a tough one because yeah. I think the ideal test of talent identification is completely unrepresentative. Mm -hmm. uh, because representative tests, people who are more experienced in the sport or had more exposure to the sport are, are automatically going to do better and often we want to tease that apart. If we want to pick, if there is such a thing as talent, we want to pick it up. We actually want to tease out experience in the sport. So the ideal talent ID test would be on a computer screen or something like that. But in reality, it's probably not going to work, right? So we've got to find the balance where we can have tasks that pick up on the skills that we want, mm -hmm. but 
um, but don't pick up on experience. Uh, just for an example, um, we looked at um, talent scouts making selections of, of players in football and soccer, and uh, they made rankings of players watching full-size games. Uh, and they made rankings of the same players playing small-sided games. And, and in, when they watched the small-sided games, they were much more likely to pick up on the technical skill, the tactical skill, whereas when they watched the full-side games, they were ranking the players on their speed and strength and stuff like that. So we, we need to be smart about uh, the designs perhaps that they're, they're observing uh, uh, that are representative of the skills that you're trying to pick up on. But I struggle with it. This one. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a great point. I think you're right. You want a balance of representative, but I think you want you still want to tap into the that capacity learning. Like maybe, it, you know, the right small side. How can they can adjust to a different version of the game or something? Right, Tra- some sort of transfer test almost is what you want, rather than mm-hmm. actually testing exactly the sport. <laughs> right, or else you're just going to yeah. get performance, like we've been saying. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, well, that's a good point. Yeah. So. I think we're coming up on the hour, guys, so I'll, I'll be good of your time. So um, any, I'll let you go. Maybe I'll go around the room and just uh, any last thoughts. These are always fun. I put you people on spot. The last <laughs> lot. But anything you want to say about kind of what you do, what you're thinking about in this area or or, or talent in, in general. Well, I guess we didn't we didn't get to our conference discussion that I promised. But uh, <laughs> um we can maybe let's do that. We can just quickly go about that. Um, so a few of the people, your uh, Nick and Joe, right, where you guys had the talent ID talent Toronto conference planned, and you part of the motivation for this was trying to change the way we do uh, conferences, uh, change the way. And I think maybe this is another thing this situation is going to provoke on its own. But can Joe, can you tell us a little bit about what what you're thinking there? If you if if you assuming you guys have a couple more minutes to hang around. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. I think um, so. One of the things was over the last, I probably going back even ten years, uh, we were reflecting on the the reality that we go to conferences for the stuff that happens. All, most of the time, happens outside of the conference sessions, the mm. the social interaction, the discussion over dinner or drinks or with coffee in the morning, that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. and it just got us thinking that the way that we deliver content at a traditional conference is maybe a bit outdated. The idea that we need to have somebody tell us a 12 minute synopsis of their research so that we know what's happening in the current research setting and we can go back and update our approach to research. Well, we used to have to do that because the time lag between when somebody was generating their data and when it would be published in a journal was so huge. We don't have that time lag anymore. It can be months when, b- between submission and, and being published. Mm-hmm. So that, for me, suggests that we have an outdated model. Uh, and so we thought, well, how do we replicate in a new approach to conferencing uh, more of the social elements? And, and the big thing for me, I think, was we have some issues, and I think we talked about a bunch of them today, that are maybe appropriate for debates Um, early specialization. There's great examples and arguments for both sides of that. And we need to actually come together and argue them out in a debate format to get someplace stronger because um, we very rarely do that. And as a scientist, those are the things that I enjoy the most when you actually see people laying it out and allowing their ideas to be challenged and not being threatened by somebody saying, I don't agree with you. Like, I think we've lost that ability to have a conversation without everybody agreeing with you all the time that's not what science is and so that was one of the things we were trying to do in this conference is what if we had no 12-minute talks and it was just debate and panels and question and answer sessions um what would that conference look like and how would people respond to it and unfortunately the response well fortunately and unfortunately the response was great Mm -hmm. And then COVID happened and we ended up having to cancel it. But the plan is for us to do it again sometime in the future, because I think the potential there is to create a new kind of discussion, a new kind of discourse. And I think our science deserves it. Yeah, I agree. And I think you get a little bit of that online and social media, but yeah. obviously it's a different, you get kind of trolling and, and you get, <laughs> you know, when people aren't in person, they get. Also, I think this area, all areas, but this area could you know, benefit a lot from planning things together, <laughs> like, uh, like replication, 
using some, we all would differ, we so many differences in the tasks and measures we use. It would be great if we could coordinate, <laughs> I always say that, you know, things and measure, let's do all do this big multi-center study, but it doesn't ever happen, but it's, it's a nice goal. Um, Nick, or your, did you want to talk a little, any more about what you guys were at the conference? Well, to me, the eye opener was a conference we organized last year on Spieker Oak, uh, Frisian Island in Germany. We had 13 people coming from Canada, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, PhD students as professors. And what we did was everyone has some time, let's say 20, 30 minutes to present their current work. And then we discuss as long as we want to discuss. Mm -hmm. And we had three days. And at the end of the third day, I talked to Ronnie Lidor, who was there as well, who's from Israel. And he said, well, you know, you had a great meeting when at the last talk, everyone is still looking at it, debating, and still enthusiastic about the topic itself. And that's something I hardly ever have at conferences anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, another 12-minute talk, next one. It's almost like fast food that you receive if you want to have the whole dinner instead. <laughs> <laughs> Good analogy. <laughs> Um, Nick or Dave. Oh, so, yeah. I think that's where we need to go. We need to have small groups. We have to be have bigger groups to be able to discuss and be opposing in views just for the fun of it to get clear about what we actually know and what we actually don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. The only the only thing that I'll that I'll just add is, I mean, in in the kind of lab meetings that. You know, the, the, uh, mine and Joe and, and your lab, uh, have had over the years. Um, the benefit for the students to be, for our grad students to be in that kind of environment where there's debate and where they can really discuss ideas, um, it really accelerates their thinking and, and energizes them. And, and to me, it's, it's been some of the, yeah, some of the biggest positives, uh, have really come from the students that they end up talking about those experiences for, for weeks and months. Um, and, and yeah, I'd, I'd just like to see their involvement in, in kind of a, an alternative conference model be, um, a little bit more active and a little bit more stimulating sometimes. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think, I think the other point we were kind of talking about before we started to is, uh, you know, the skill expertise talent area, there's so many important topics. It's such a growing area that it's time, almost time. It needs its own focus in a conference meeting it gets well it's at a bunch of conferences and really small slices but i think it's big enough that we could you know we could pull it out and at least have some meetings but so hopefully we can do that if the world lets us conference again <laughs> so but um anyways guys um i i think we'll wrap it up there i'll let you don't want to keep you guys all evening or day or whatever the, um um, so I'll just, I will save you the, the, the last word. We had a little discussion. So um, I'm going to end the recording, everyone. So thanks very much, guys, for joining me. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Thanks for the really fun discussion, guys. And remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.